Well, good morning. So glad to see you here. I want to welcome those of you who are joining us online. This is our third week as we're making our way through the New Testament book of 1 Timothy. I want to invite you to go ahead and pull out a Bible or use your phone and find this passage right here, 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 11 uh, through 15. Uh, I'm going to go fast today. I'm going to cover a lot of ground today. Please don't give yourself carpal tunnel by trying to write down everything uh, that's interesting to you. I want you to know I make uh, the manuscript, I make all my notes available online every week. Take advantage of that. Now, if you are familiar with this passage right here, you probably came this morning with a mixture of excitement and anxiety. A lot of you have been sending me messages this week. Rick, I'm praying for you because it just feels like This message today is a big deal for our church. And some of you might be wondering, what in the world is going on? If you're unfamiliar with this passage or if you're relatively new uh, to our church, I want you to know I think you picked a great day to be here with us. This passage that we're about to read together, I believe it is the single most controversial passage in all of the New Testament. And... uh, So because you're here today, you get to see the kind of church that we are, the kind of church that we want to be. Last Sunday night at our annual meeting, our elder board announced to you, they they shared that this is what they believe our church practice should be, this is what our church practice is, that women may serve in and occupy any position of leadership. And I hope that that's, I hope you're not hearing that for the first time. If you are hearing that for the first time, you need to sign up for our weekly update. That's one of the big ways that we try to communicate all the important stuff to you. But if you are hearing it for the first time, this is what we're talking about today. And this is what this passage really is about. So let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to start in verse 11. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet, for Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Now, there's significant disagreement over what to do with this passage. And there's all kinds of nuance but we can divide the two, uh, two broad groups into this. There's the group that says, because of this passage, there should be restrictions on women when it comes to teaching and exercise authority over men, especially in the church. And then there's another group that reads this passage, and they say, you know what? There should not be restrictions on women when it comes to teaching and exercising authority over men and the church. For the majority of my life, For the majority of my career as a pastor, I was in the camp that said there should be. There should be restrictions on women when it comes to teaching and and exercising authority over men in the church. It's what I was taught. It's what I believed. It's what I taught others to believe. And if I could just be candid with you, if I could just be really honest and vulnerable with you, I never tried to understand the other side's point of view. Whenever this subject came up, I only tried and I always tried to better understand the view that I already had that there should be restrictions on women in teaching and in leadership. It was about seven years ago that I felt like I was infected with a question. Have you, have you ever been grabbed by a question and it's like it burrows its way into your brain and it won't relent until you answer it? This was that question for me. How do I make sense of? How do I make sense of the fact that there are people who love Jesus just as much as I do, who love and revere God's word just as much as I do, and yet they believe there should be no restrictions on women, and they believe that women can be leaders and pastors and elders. How do I make sense of that? And so I decided I was going to take a new approach. Instead of making assumptions about them, I wanted to understand what it was that convinced them. And what I discovered is that the affirmative view that women are able to teach and lead equally in the same way as men that it is incredibly old, that it's a historic view within Christian faith, that this view affirming women is actually centuries older than the rise of feminism, and that there are biblical scholars who are brilliant, who love Jesus, who base this view 100% on their understanding of Scripture. They have a biblical case for that. 
And some of us might be wondering, some of you might be wondering, how can that be? Are you serious? I mean, it just looks so obvious. Paul said, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. It seems so clear. It just seems open and shut. And if this is all that we had to go on, I don't know that my mind would have ever changed. But this isn't all that we have, is it? Now, one of the things I just want you to know I love about you guys is you guys make it safe. You, all, you guys make it safe for me to be honest and real and vulnerable, even if it gets messy. Are you still down with me being honest and vulnerable, real, even if it gets messy? Yes. Okay, all right. You came ready. There are no less than four very clear statements in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Here they are. Men are to pray with hands lifted up. Women are not to have elaborate hairstyles, wear jewelry, or expensive clothes. A woman is not to teach or have authority over man. Women are saved through childbearing. So this is, this is my question. Why do we act as, why do we pretend as though there's only one clear statement instead of four? Why do people join churches or leave churches based on just one of these statements instead of all four statements? This first statement right here, men are to pray with hands literally lifted up. Now, one of the things that I've noticed in our church and in other churches that I've been to is that men don't do that. Now, that means, yes, I had my eyes open during the prayer. But this is clear, right? Why don't people get animated? Why don't people get excited over the fact that men are not doing this? Men, we got to be honest with ourselves. We are not following what the Bible clearly says to do. So with all sincerity, this is my question. What's the deal with picking and choosing which statements we're going to follow as clear and which clear statements we're going to ignore or explain away? How about this one? Women are not to wear, have elaborate hairstyles and jewelry and expensive clothes. I've noticed some of you ladies have some very lovely hair. You're probably dropping some nice coin on that. There are women wearing jewelry right now. And you have nice clothes. But this is clear, right? Now, this is the one that gets the attention. Women are not to teach or have authority over men. But what about this one? Women are saved through childbearing. Women are saved through giving birth. It's clear, right? Who in here believes that a woman gets to go to heaven based on how many kids she has? Nobody? This is where we have to be so honest with ourselves that it's going to get messy. Most people, this is what most people do. They interpret these first two statements culturally and explain them away culturally. They take the third one literally as though there's no cultural implications whatsoever and ignore the fourth one altogether. Now, come on. Does that sound right? Does that sound like taking the Bible seriously. One of the things seven years ago when this process began for me, one of the things I had to get honest with about myself is that I was picking and choosing which statements I was treating as clear and which ones I was explaining away. I don't think I was the only one, was I? Instead of picking and choosing which statements we're going to treat as clear and pay attention to, let's take them all seriously. So this is what we're going to do together this morning. I'm going to share with you some things that helped me. I'm going to share with you some things that challenged me. I'm going to share with you why I changed my thinking and my understanding of this passage. And along the way, there's going to be very, very broad agreement and disagreement in this room. That's okay. That's totally allowed. After this service, you can come up to me. You can say, Pastor Rick, I love you, but I just don't see it like you. I disagree with you. Listen, I'm, I'm trying to launch my third teenager out of the house. I'm used to being disagreed with. All right? That's okay. That's allowed. You don't ever have to fully agree on anything to be fully welcomed and fully wanted here. Think about baptism. Our people in our church, we have all kinds of different views and all kinds of different personal experiences with baptism, don't we? And yet our church has a singular practice, and we all love each other, and we can be unified. Do you know why it's safe to disagree? 
Because our unity is based on being in Christ, not being in agreement. You know what else is true? God's Word is inspired, not our interpretation of it. That means any one of us, at any given time, our understanding, our interpretation could be wrong. Now believe it or not, it is not my goal today to convince you to see it the way that I see it. My goal today is to share with you what convinced me. To share with you the kinds of things that over the years have convinced the majority of men on our elder board leading to this decision. Now, if I could be this bold and I could get us all to agree on one thing, it would be this right here. The people with whom you disagree have biblical reasons for their few, not just one side, both sides. And their attempt, the people that disagree with you, and their attempt to take the Bible seriously, they landed at a different understanding than you. And I'm not trying to imply that all sides are right. That would be incoherent, contradictory nonsense. And yet, and you've got to hear me on this, and yet, all sides can be on the right track if everybody is doing their best to understand as best that they can while holding on to each other in love and unity and simultaneously holding on to the interpretation that they think is best. N.T. Wright is a brilliant scholar. Uh, This week I was listening to him talk about this very subject, and he said this, live in such a way that we don't make demands on one another's conscience, but we may make demands on one another's charity. That's good, right? Let's all hold on to one another in love and unity while we also hold on to the interpretation that we think is best. Now, the art and science of interpretation is called hermeneutics. And today is going to feel like hermeneutics 101. And it's going to be fun. It's going to be challenging. But I do think it's going to be helpful for your note taker. Would you write this down? Understanding the text is always possible, but it's not always easy. It's always possible, but it's not always easy. There are factors at play conspiring against you and against me, working against our ability to understand. Here are some of those factors. The original language, cultural context, historical context, and literary context. The original language of the New Testament is Koine Greek. There's a little bit that's Aramaic. The rest is Koine Greek. That's not the same as modern Greek. Like if you go to somebody who speaks modern Greek, they're not going to help you. They don't know because Koine Greek is an old, dead language, right? But all of these things right here, all of these factors can be investigated, evaluated, and taken into account so that we can understand the text. But it's not going to happen on accident. It takes purposeful work. And if we don't do the work, we're not going to be able to understand. So let's begin. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. Guys, it's so easy. It is super duper easy to hear that in our brains as this. A woman should be silent as she learns in full submission to a man. But that's not what it says, is it? And it's not what it means This word quietness right here, it's the same word for quiet that's used in verse 2 of this chapter where it says, pray for kings and all those in authority over you so that you may live peaceful, quiet lives. It has nothing to do with volume or talking or how much or how quiet you talk, anything like that. It has everything to do with a disposition of peace. And this word submission, it's not about submission necessarily to a person or to a group or a woman, to all men. It is an attitude. It's an internal characteristic. And by the way, Jesus was the perfect model of humble submission. Bill Mounts might be the most trusted scholar. He's among the most trusted Greek scholars in America today. His textbook for Greek grammar is used to teach 90% of Koine Greek students in the U.S. It is the textbook that my professor assigned to me when I was studying Greek in college and seminary. Um, And I just, I want to share with you his perspective and just how challenging this is and how he changed his mind even after writing a commentary on this. He says, when talking about women in Ephesian leadership, Paul starts by saying, a woman should learn in quietness and all submissiveness, but submissive to whom? In my commentary, I focus on the object of a woman's submissiveness. Submissive to whom? 
Submissive to her husband? Submissive to every man? Absolutely not. Rob and my wife is never required to be submissive to any one man. Submissive to all men? Absolutely not. Submissive to the elders as a group? That was my conclusion. He goes on to say, I was always uncomfortable with that conclusion since it isn't what the text actually says. Maybe what Paul is requiring is a submissive character. Many, if not most, of the other instructions to women have to do with character. And the reason I wanted to share this with you is just to show you how challenging and difficult this passage is. Here's one of the most trusted Greek scholars in America today. It took him 10 years to write a commentary on 1 Timothy. And when he's done, he goes, ah, I think I got it wrong. I think it's just about a submissive character. And one of the reasons I want to share this with you, when someone tells you, hey, this is clear, this is straightforward, it's simple, they are not telling you the facts. So thus far, we're not seeing a difference between men and women. Both men and women need to learn. Both men and women, like Jesus, need to be humble and submissive. Both men and women need to have a quiet, peaceful disposition. But what about this? I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. Again, this is the exact same word for quiet. It doesn't mean silence. It doesn't mean not talking. It's about a disposition of peacefulness. Now here's the million dollar question. How can a church like ours, who says that we take God's word seriously, that we happily submit to God's word, that we're going to follow God's word no matter what it says, even if that means we're out of step with culture, how can a church like ours say there should be no restrictions on women in teaching and leadership in the church? Well, this is where it requires some more hermeneutics. I invite you to write this down. Context is supreme. We've got to understand things in context. Context is always supreme. I'm going to put up an image, and I think it's going to help you understand exactly what I'm talking about. There are four circles of biblical context. One is the immediate chapter. Then there's the entire book. There's the writings by the same author. And then there's the context of the entire Bible. Whenever we go with an interpretation, it has to harmonize with every circle. It can't harmonize with most. It can't just check three out of four. It has to harmonize with all of them. The, entire cha- the, the immediate chapter, entire book, same author, and the Bible. And if an interpretation doesn't harmonize with all four of those, the work is not done. So here's the question. Does the interpretation that there should be restrictions on women in teaching and exercising authority, does that fit with the immediate chapter? Yeah, it does. Does it fit with the entire book? Well, we're going to be studying this book for the next several weeks. You're going to get to make that decision whether or not you think it fits with the entire book. Does it fit with everything else that the Apostle Paul wrote about women and leadership and teaching and exercising authority? Well, that's a decision that all of us have to make as interpreters. I'm going to share with you some information. You decide. In Acts chapter 18, we meet a couple named Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla is the wife. Uh, They are leaders in the church. They join Paul in ministry. They travel with him to Corinth. They travel with him on to Ephesus where they host a church in their house, and they both have a teaching ministry, and this is well before Timothy ever gets there. And together they disciple a man who goes on to be a very famous preacher named Apollos. In Acts 18, we read this, when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, Apollos, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. Who's named first? Priscilla, the wife. Now that's a big cultural no-no. That's way outside the norm. You would never do that in that culture, but she is given the primary position of honor when this leadership couple, this couple who are leaders are are presented, and they both teach the man, Apollos, and they invite him to their home, right? And homes, yes, are places where where, where you have privacy, but they're also very public settings where business is done, where religious gatherings are, are happening. The Apostle Paul lets us know that wherever they go, Priscilla and Aquila host churches in their home. They do house churches. They don't have like what we have right now. Congregations gather together in a house. And we can read this as saying, listen, these, it's three of them meeting privately in a home. You can interpret it that way. It's also just as reasonable, perhaps more so, 
to read this as Apollos was invited to join the congregation that met in their home and that he was discipled under both Priscilla and Aquila. Unless the context states otherwise, when people are gathering in a home, that's always a church. It's a congregation in the New Testament. And wherever we land, wherever you land on how to interpret what Paul means about women teaching and exercising authority, it's all of our responsibility to fully take into account Priscilla was a church leader with a teaching ministry and the church at Ephesus, by the way, that's where Timothy is, she had a teaching ministry in the church at Ephesus that included teaching men. There's another woman we need to take into account. She's a woman who was entrusted and empowered as a leader by Paul. Her name is Phoebe. Phoebe. In Romans 16, we read about her. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Sincrea. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been the benefactor of many people, including me. Phoebe is the one who literally carried the New Testament book of Romans, which was a letter by Paul to that church. She carried it. And she's described as a deacon and a benefactor, which means she had influence and leadership over many people. And for her to carry the letter of Romans to the church in Rome, she had to travel more than 600 miles from her home. And there's no way she would have traveled alone. Paul could have just as easily entrusted any able-bodied man to do it, but he chose her a woman. And what we need to understand is that when you delivered a letter back then, it's not just like the postman drops off a letter for us today. The letter carrier very often represented the writer and would read the letter and would talk about what the writer meant and represent the sender to the recipient. Lucas Blumwell is a, a New Testament a scholar and expert on ancient Christian documents. This is what he has to say. The letter carrier served to extend and clarify the message so that it was properly contextualized and interpreted in the intended manner by the recipient. The letter carrier was thought to be a trusted friend or an associate or agent who could accurately and faithfully relay the oral component of the message. In such cases, it even seems that at times the letter carrier acted not just as an intermediary between the sender and recipient, but that he was invested with authority to carry on and extend the dialogue and in a way vicariously stood in for the sender who could not be physically present. It was expected that the, that the letter carrier would read the letter with all the intonations and inflections as though the writer was there. Do you know what this means? Romans is the longest letter written by Paul. It's the most theologically complex letter written by Paul. It's the most expensive letter written by Paul. And he entrusted it to a woman. And we weren't there, so we don't know with 100% certainty. But the facts of history tell us what is most likely is she is the one who read it, who answered questions about it, and explained it to the recipients who were hearing it for the very first time. Wherever you land on your interpretation of what Paul meant by women teaching and exercising authority, it's all of our responsibility to take fully into account how he, Paul, entrusted and empowered Phoebe as a leader, and she very likely is the first person to ever teach in a church the New Testament book of Romans. I also need to see something like this. 1 Corinthians 11, women, this is according to Paul, are expected to pray and prophesy in a church. Go and read it. Now, don't get distracted by the head covering stuff. Focus on what's clear. Paul expected women to prophesy in a church. And with that in mind, read 1 Corinthians 14, 31. For you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be, what? What's this word? Instructed and encouraged. The purpose of prophecy is instruction. Now, there, with this passage, if you're familiar with it, there's all kinds of questions and things we need to talk about, but I don't have time right now, so let's just focus on what's clear. Paul expected women to prophesy in the church, and the purpose of prophecy is instruction, which means teaching. Wherever you land, wherever you land on your interpretation of what Paul meant about women teaching and exercising authority, it's all of our responsibility to fully take into account that he expected women to prophesy in the church where there are men for the purpose of teaching. There's one more thing I want us to see. 
1 Corinthians 16 says this, You know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and they have devoted themselves to the service of the Lord's people. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to submit to such people and to everyone who joins in the Lord's work and labors at it. And the same way that it was appropriate to submit to a leadership of a man like Stephanus, one of the earliest converts who's now leading in the church, Paul said, I want all of you to submit to everyone who works and labors in ministry just like Stephanus is doing. Now, the cool thing is we don't have to guess. We don't have to wonder, who did Paul consider workers who labor in ministry? Because he tells us. He tells us in many places in the New Testament. Here are some. Priscilla, Aquila, Mary, Andronicus, Junia, Urbanus, Tryphena, Tryphosa, Persis, and Timothy. Now, I highlighted the names of women. Paul said, to submit to all who work and labor in ministry. So what does this mean if we're taking Paul seriously on this? Paul urged all believers to submit to all co-workers who labor in ministry. Whoever Paul identifies as a co-worker who labors in ministry should be submitted to by all believers. Paul identified numerous women as co-workers who labor in ministry. Paul urged that all believers, therefore, submit to numerous women who labor in ministry. Therefore, Paul urged men to submit to women who labor in ministry. Wherever you land on your understanding of what Paul meant by teaching and exercising authority, it's all of our responsibility to fully take into account that Paul urged all believers, men included, to submit to all who work and labor in ministry, women included. Now, if you're feeling confused right now, that's okay. If you're feeling like, I feel like Paul's kind of contradicting himself. I think the New Testament contradicts itself. I can understand why you would think that. I don't think that's the case. I don't think it is contradictory. And this is, this is where hermeneutics really helps. We always interpret the unclear in light of the clear. When something is unclear or confusing and we don't know how to fit it in, we interpret it in light of the clear. This is the decision. This is the judgment call that all of you have to make as you interpret. Which is more clear? I don't expect you to be able to read all of this from your seat, but you can see it online on the notes. There's all the things that we just covered. Is that more clear? Or is this verse more clear? Should we read this in light of this, or this, in light of that. That's the decision. That's the judgment call you have to make. And I'm not going to tell you what to think. I will tell you what I think. I will tell you about the way of thinking that's influenced and led our elder board to make the decision that they did. And it's that this is more clear than this. And that this verse should be read in light of all of this, not ignoring all of this. You know what? I could be wrong. We could be wrong. You could be wrong. At the very least, I hope it's a comfort to you to know that we're not asking anybody to take any part of the Bible less seriously Just the opposite. It is our hope that every single one of us will take all of it with the utmost seriousness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. In Greek, it literally reads like this. It sounds like this. I am not permitting a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. It's not a command. It's simply a declarative of what Paul is not currently permitting. And if Paul is just simply talking about teaching and the normal exercise of authority, we have a question to ask. Is that restriction permanent or is it temporary? That's an interpreted decision that every single one of you, every single one of us has to make. If he's just talking about simple teaching and the normal exercise of authority, is it permanent or is it temporary? If that's what he's talking about, I think it's temporary and this is why. 
False teaching was running rampant in the church at Ephesus. People, especially women, had not been taught the gospel. Men were fighting in the church, and women who hadn't yet learned the gospel were using their status to impose themselves as leaders. And instead, the solution was women need equal access to education as the man so that they can learn first because learning always needs to come before any kind of leading. This is not going to be the only time we see this. We're going to see this again next week when we move into chapter 3 and we look at qualifications for elders and leaders. And one of the things Paul says is an elder should not be a new convert because they might become prideful. What they need to do is truly learn humility. Learning always comes before leading. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. It's completely understandable to me that someone would look at this and says, it just seems like Paul is always against women ever having any kind of authority over a man. The problem is that's not what that means. What we read Two words, assume authority in English, and Koine Greek, it's just one word, and it looks like this. And that word is authentic. And this is an incredibly rare word. In fact, it's only used one time in the entire Bible, right here. Now, there is a much more common word used for authority in the New Testament, and that word is this one, exousia. This is the word that Jesus used to describe his own authority in Matthew 28 when Jesus said, all authority has been given to me. This is the word that he used. The word that's used to describe um, leadership and authority in the church is exousia. The most common word used to describe authority by government leaders is exousia. This is a very common word, and what exousia means by authority is exactly what you and I mean when we're talking about healthy, good expressions of authority, but authentane is different. Authentane has about 12 different definitions attached to it. One of them is murder. Authentane is a negative word. It is not a positive word. and has the same root as like autonomy. It is self-imposed authority and leadership. It is abusive. It's usurping. It's domineering. It's taking control. Did you know that the Apostle Paul actually taught that women are to have exousia, authority, over men. In his longest, most comprehensive, most clear teaching on the relationship between husbands and wives, which is 1 Corinthians 7, the Apostle Paul says this verse. He says men are to have exousia, authority, over their wives. And then he blows everybody's mind. And he says, and the wives are to have exousia, authority, over their husbands' bodies. Husbands had that authority over their wives' bodies. Wives had that authority over their husbands' bodies. That would have blown everybody's minds. That was so provocative and controversial in the day. And his longest, most comprehensive, most clear teaching on the relationship between men and women, the Apostle Paul taught that both men and women have authority over each other. So why did he use this word? Because there were women in the church at Ephesus who were using their wealth and their social status to assert themselves in a position of control. And that's inappropriate behavior by women, and it's also inappropriate behavior by men. One of my favorite pastors of all time was a man named John Chrysostom. He was the Archbishop of Constantinople. He died in 407 AD. He thought in Koine Greek. He spoke Koine Greek. He preached in Koine Greek, the language of the New Testament. And in one of his sermons on the relationship between husbands and wives, I want you to hear what he said about husbands. He said, a husband should not authenticate his wife. Same word, different conjugation. Same word. This approach to leadership and authority, and power, and control is off-limits to every follower of Jesus. No one, no one should ever usurp, domineer, try to take control. It's anti-gospel. So the question is, why would the Apostle Paul said, um, a woman is not to, I'm not permitting a woman to teach or authentain a man? I want you to imagine a teacher 
who has an unruly student in her classroom, and she says something like this, I'm not going to let you walk in here and disrupt my class. Do you think that teacher is saying, I'm not permitting a student to walk in my class? Does that make sense? Nobody in their right mind would say, yeah, you're not allowed to walk. There's something going on in this passage that's grammarly, grammatically it's called an ude clause. And in an ude clause, you are able to take two verbs and bring them together as meaning one thing, teaching and uh, usurping or assuming authority. It's the exact same thing this teacher would be doing. What is she saying? I'm not going to let you come in here in a disruptive manner. I'm not going to let you behave in a disruptive manner. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul was saying. I'm not allowing, I'm not permitting women to teach in a domineering or usurping way or try to lead or exercise control in a domineering or usurping way. He goes on to say, for Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. This is where the historical and cultural context is so critical. It is absolutely paramount. There were a couple of different false teachings trying to impose control in the Ephesian church, and Paul is correcting them. One is an early version of Gnosticism. The other is based on worship and belief in the goddess Artemis. Gnosticism taught that Eve was created first and Adam came second. Artemis worship taught that Artemis was the sister of the god Apollos, but she was born first, he was born second. Paul's correcting this. He's saying, no, 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 no. Listen, Adam, men, Adam was made first, then women came. Here's another thing that Gnosticism taught, that back in the garden, Eve wasn't even there. Adam was the one who was deceived, and he's the reason. His deception is the reason we sin, and Paul is correcting that. He's correcting that bad theology. And when he is appealing back to the creation account, I do not believe he's appealing back to the order of creation to say, women, to say that men have an honored and privileged position above women. I think he's appealing back to that to demonstrate, no, 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 women don't have an honored and privileged position above men. If you read Genesis chapter 1, God created both man and woman equally. Both are made in his image. Both equal responsibilities to rule and reign. And when he, appeal, when he talks about what happened with sin, I think that the Apostle Paul is trying to demonstrate the dangers and the consequences when someone is deceived. And Paul never, ever roots deception or vulnerability to deception in gender. Both, according to the way Paul writes, both men and women are equally vulnerable to deception. Have you ever noticed this? In his second letter to the Corinthian church, Paul wrote this, I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. He then goes on to say, for if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit than the spirit you received, or a different gospel than the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. You guys don't have any discernment. You keep letting yourself get deceived. And this was not written to just the ladies. This was to the whole church at Corinth. The problem with deception is this. It's there because of an underdeveloped sense of discernment that makes someone unable to identify false teaching, refute false teaching, and withstand false teaching, which is ultimately rooted in the lies of Satan. Wouldn't it be a weird interpretation to say no one from Corinth can now teach? They were all, men and women alike, deceived in the same way that Eve was. And the antidote to deception is truth. It's learning. So that's why Paul said this to Timothy. Eve was insufficiently prepared to resist the lies of Satan. Eve was deceived and then sinned. Therefore, all believers, and in this case, women especially, need to be educated. They need equal access to education as the men, or they will be vulnerable to deception like Eve. 1 Timothy in general, in chapter 2 in particular, is not about gender roles. It's about the difference between truth and lies and what you need to be able to withstand deception, which is to know the truth. First learn 
Leading comes after that. What about this last sentence? Women will be saved through childbearing. Now, I think we all know that giving birth has been a very dangerous thing for women for most of human history. Childbirth is very painful. Obviously, I don't know from experience. I've never given birth. I have had a cold, so I could probably relate. (laughs) According to the cult of Artemis, the goddess Artemis was spiritually present with women as they gave birth to keep them safe through the process of giving birth. And Artemis is always depicted as carrying a bow with arrows, and those arrows had poison tips which allowed her to kill someone quickly and painlessly. And the belief was she was spiritually present, and if a woman was going to die in childbirth, instead of letting her suffer in anguish for a long period of time, it was believed that Artemis would euthanize her. She was ferociously adored and revered by the people of Ephesus. I want you to imagine with me. There's a young woman young expectant mom. She's in the church at Ephesus. She's a brand new believer. She was raised in the cult of Artemis. She's afraid of what's going to happen when she goes through the process of giving birth. And of course, she's praying to Jesus. Do you think it's possible that she, just to hedge her bets to make sure everything's okay, that she prays to Artemis too? Of course, we do that kind of thing all the time. Do we trust Jesus? Yeah, we trust him. Sometimes we trust our money. Do we trust Jesus? Yeah. Sometimes we trust politics. Do we trust Jesus? Absolutely. But sometimes we really trust being in control. This statement does not mean that a woman is more acceptable or worthy of entering heaven if she has children and stays holy enough. This was an urgent and beautiful promise to expectant moms You're not saved because you give birth. But no matter what happens, whether you live or whether you die, you are safe in Jesus because of what he has done for you and you have trusted in him. So you can break up with the false promises of Artemis worship. Far from being misogynistic and oppressive to women, this is an incredibly empathetic engagement with women. This morning we've covered a lot of ground. And I've shared quite a few things with you, probably more than anybody, it's fair to expect anybody to process in one sitting. So I want to encourage you to take the time and to do the work of interpretation. And may we all hold on to each other in love and unity while we also hold on to the interpretation that we think is best. Now, may we be people who never make demands on one another's conscience, but we can make demands on one another's charity. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's knowable. We thank you that it's understandable, and we don't complain that it takes work. It's an expression of love on our part. And God, we want to because your word is how we know Jesus. May we be people whose hearts and minds are captivated by him. God, may we never tire of reading and studying and digging in and happily submitting to what we understand to be true. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.